that occurring. But the goal at the, at the, for the start of this school was to respond to the uh, both local, national, and, and really global need at the time to produce engineers that could thrive in the uh, middle of the industrial age, the age where value was created by the utilization of physical resources and manual labor. But today, many of us understand that, at least for the for the rest of the world, we are entering what uh, some are calling the conceptual age. Uh, an age now where value is created by the exploitation of ideas. A change in the paradigm for the education of engineers, and that's what we're here to, to talk about. Because we understand now <clears throat> the need to be creating engineers that can solve the most pr pressing problems facing our nation and the entire world. <clears throat> and what grand challenge that the world is facing right now is more critical for life as we know it than the need to meet the ever-increasing energy demands on a global scale. <clears throat> but we need to be meeting those needs in a way that is both economically feasible, both today and, in, in, and tomorrow, <clears throat> but also environmentally sustainable today and tomorrow. But today we have the very, uh, very, we're very privileged to have with us one of the world leaders in addressing this most critical grand challenge for humankind. Mr. Greg Boyce is chairman and chief executive officer, officer of Peabody Energy, the world's largest private sector coal company. Mr. Boyce is the only CEO to be named among the very finest chief executives for both the energy and mining sectors, garnering recognition from Institutional Investor Magazine and the Global Energy Awards. He also was named one of America's most valuable chief executive officers by Chief Executive Magazine, ranking 36 among the S&P 500 chief executives. But of course, the most important thing about Mr. Boyce is that he was trained as a mining engineer. <laughs> but he's gained extensive management, operating, and engineering experience around the world during a three-decade career in the energy industry. He joined Peabody Energy in 2003 as President and Chief Operating Officer and assumed responsibility for the company as President and Chief Executive Officer in 2006 and became Chairman the following year. Help me to welcome Mr. Boyce. Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you for that uh, warm introduction and kind welcome. It's uh, clearly a pleasure to be here. Um, I want to lead off this morning uh, by sharing a safety contact. And this is a Peabody Energy tradition uh, that I hope will become a University of Texas El Paso tradition. Um, we view safety as a core value at a 24-hour 24 24-hour job. Every meeting at every headquarter at our headquarters in the field, everywhere our operations exist and our offices are in the world start with a safety contact. So I'll begin with a safety contact uh, for all of you basketball fans uh, here in the, in the audience. Um, how many uh, attended Wednesday's game against Tulsa? I think uh, the Don packs about 12,000 people. Um, and uh, I know you all know who won that game. But how many of you can recall the details around exactly where the emergency exit was from the seat where you were sitting. Such details often escape us. Um, all of us should be aware of our surroundings at work, at school, away, whatever we travel. Know where your emergency exits are, just as you should know where they are here at the conference center. And I might add, there's one on the left and the right here, and then there's two in the back of the room <laughs> so that we're all aware of where those emergency exits are. Um, and for those of you that are going to be attending the game tomorrow against Tulane, take a moment to think about where's the closest exit from the arena. Uh, and of course, good luck to the miners again. So now let's turn uh, to the business at hand. Because today I really want to talk about building a sustainable future in the context of three vital drivers. Energy, the economy, and the environment. What I call the three E's. Low-cost energy is essential to rising standard of livings that create jobs and empowers economies. Our energy solutions also must be developed to advance our environmental goals. 
Today I'll focus on three things. Number one, our first value is creating global energy access. There is no sustainability with energy poverty or lack of adequate energy access. Number two, using more coal more cleanly requires deploying advanced technologies, some I've seen this morning in the work that's happening here, on a path to near zero emissions. Advanced coal generation is key to our economic and our environmental goals. And three, leadership. In a sustainable world, it's the ability to look ahead to where you need to be as a business or an organization or as a society, aligning the talent and executing the strategies to get there. So let me start with the first three E goal, energy. The world needs more energy everywhere, all the time. And we're faced with unprecedented long-term demands. By 2050, global GDP will be up 270% from where it is today. Electricity generation will be up 130%. And steel production will be up 275%. World population is expected to reach 9 billion people, with the vast majority of those living in cities, where more power per capita is used than in typical rural community settings. In order to sustain this growth, we forecast as much as 16 billion tons of coal will be needed for electricity and steel, which is well over twice what the world uses today. And that doesn't account all other forms of energy that will also have to grow. Now the hyper energy growth that we're seeing is being driven by China, which is industrializing and urbanizing at an extraordinary pace. Now I know we all think of Texas as a pretty big place, <laughs> but there's more than 60 global cities that are larger than Dallas. The United States has 51 metropolitan areas topping a million or more. Australia has five. But you compare that to China, which today has 160 cities, 160 cities with over a million people, and that's forecast to grow to 220 cities of over a million people just by 2025. Now with China, we're faced with energy needs for growth that is occurring at breakneck speeds unprecedented. In this before and after image, which I selected for today, you can see the surprising transformation of Shanghai in 20 years. This growth started at the time when most of you were born. And but by the time you entered college, that's how far that one city in China came. Today, Shanghai ranks as the world's 10th largest city with a population of just under 20 million people. Two decades of growth. And it's happening as we speak across the entire Asian platform. So as we look at enormous energy needs in the developing world, I want all of us to think beyond the comfort of this beautiful campus. Entering the villages of Sub-Saharan Africa, Asia, and elsewhere, where families need electricity for the most basic needs clean water, warmth, and light. More than half the world's population today lacks proper energy access. And 1.3 billion people have no access at all. Now, if my history is correct, we put somebody on the moon in 1969, yet we sit here today with that level of energy poverty on a global basis. I'd like to share with you a literal depiction of our global challenge. Beth, can we uh, roll the tape?
Now the face of energy poverty is all too stark, and it is too human. Beyond the poor living conditions, the lack of education, and other obvious lifts that come from energy access, uh, or ills that come from the lack of energy access, we lose one and a half million people to the effects of energy poverty every year. And these are tragic conditions that as a global society we need to address. I'll submit to all of you that in my view, the greatest crisis we confront in the 21st century is not an environmental crisis predicted by man-made computer models, but a human crisis that's fully within our power to solve. For every person or agency who has voiced a 2050 greenhouse gas goal, we need 10 people and 10 policy bodies working toward the goal of broad energy access to reduce global poverty as job number one. It is the only way to start that path to long-term sustainability and it's something that we need to begin to focus on as our highest priority. Energy is a human right and it's a rapidly rising need. We're seeing a demographic of, 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 of low-income in China and India moving to middle class that is unprecedented in the history of the earth that all require energy to have a sustainable future. You can see here that every tenfold increase in electricity is clearly linked to a 10-year increase in longevity, better standard of living, higher literacy rates, and a much healthier population. In fact, there's a profound correlation between electrification and what the UN Human Development Organization calls their development index. To reach the upper levels of the index, Academics call for at least 4,000 kilowatts of electricity per person per year. I will tell you even that's a conservative number compared to the European Union, which uses about 50% more electricity per capita than that number, and they're often cited as we ought to be more like their per capita use. Now I'd also submit that coal is the only sustainable fuel with the scale to reach our energy access goal. This is a near perfect correlation again between expanding coal use and growing economies. A rapid rise in the world's use of coal fuel electricity mirrors the global rise in GDP. Since 1970, coal use has increased approximately 300%. This is what we call the economic miracle powered by coal. And we're seeing it happening in the strongest developing nations around the globe today. Coal has been the fastest growing fuel in the world over the past decade. And global coal demand today stands at more than 7 billion tons of coal per year. The greatest demand comes from China, India, and other emerging economies that are expected to fuel about 90% of coal's demand by 2030. Now the world has an enormous supply of coal that will last another century or more. Coal is abundant. It's located on every major continent and will continue to shoulder our energy load well into the future. The International Energy Agency has forecast a 65% increase in global coal use by 2035 under its current policy scenario. Now, based on this forecast, coal will become the largest energy source in the world by 2035, surpassing that of oil today. Just by 2020, the incremental coal fuel generation will exceed the growth in gas, oil, nuclear, biomass, geothermal, and solar combined on a global basis. China, India, and the rest of Asia comprise the vast majority of this demand growth as these nations move through rapid industrialization and unprecedented urbanization. We are literally seeing U.S.-sized populations migrating to cities this creates a new middle class that needs modern conveniences like cars, air conditioning, and the electronics that all require steel to make and power to run. We all see the lines of people lined up for iPhones in places like Beijing. Every one of those devices needs to be connected. And as that population grows and develops, that connectivity demand will get stronger and stronger through time. So it's clear that the emerging economies are relying on coal. Significant new coal plants are coming online that are highly efficient, 
producing energy with less fuel and lower emissions. This year, nearly 90 gigawatts of coal-based generating plants are expected to come online around the world. That's equivalent to three new 500 megawatt plants starting up each year. It's also equivalent to about 25% of the U.S. installed coal generating fleet every year. Over the next four years, 400 gigawatts, or greater than the entire U.S. stall base, is expected to be built and brought online on a global basis. So if you add up that demand, the need for coal is expected to rise by about a billion tons a year over that time frame. Now we also see growth in metallurgical coal markets, which are a critical component of producing steel. They're expected to grow by about 40% in this decade. And this will require about 400 million more tons of additional metallurgical coal. I would tell you that the current international trade for metallurgical coal is right around 300 million tons today. So that's the kind of growth that we're going to see. And again, it's China, India, Brazil that are expected to drive this demand for the same reasons we've just discussed. Urbanization and strong economic growth. So this paints a picture of a world where coal will be hugely in demand. So that takes us to our next 3E goal, the environment. And how do we match these two objectives? A greater deployment of clean coal technology is the solution for meeting our economic and environmental goals. Here you see the Green Gen Low Carbon Coal Project in China. It's a project which Peabody is the only non-Chinese company in the world that's a participant in this facility. It'll be the world's largest near zero emissions coal plant with carbon capture at a full 650 megawatt operating capacity. But I would also say that coal has had a strong and improving environmental track record here in the United States. As major technologies became available and online, the United States has made significant strides in reducing sulfur dioxide, nitrous oxides, and other emissions. Use of coal fueled electricity has nearly tripled since 1970, as regulated emissions per megawatt hour have decreased by almost 90%. And this data is all based on U.S. Uh, Energy Information Administration and EPA data. So when there's a time frame that's put out in front of us, technologies that are developed to solve the solution, coal as a fuel has always been able to meet that challenge and put in performances that say that you can have economic activity and significant environmental improvement. Now this trend will continue as the nation's utilities continue to invest hundreds of millions of dollars in continuing green technologies for coal. Now a major step in the path to near zero emissions from coal is the deployment of supercritical technology. These plants are highly efficient, typically have an emissions rate that is one fifth the average of the US fleet. And even their carbon dioxide emissions rate is as much as 40% below the oldest plants that we have here today. Supercritical plants run at much higher temperature and pressure, and that allows them to, confer, to convert the energy in coal to electricity at a much higher uh, rate, which is what reduces all of the um, emissions on a per unit of electricity basis. Um, and it's something that I know that the uh, facilities uh, that I saw this morning are spending a lot of time working on thermal efficiency, uh, turbine dynamics, uh, turbine design, turbine metallurgies to try and continue to push the envelope here for much greater efficiencies. Now, as a, I will tell you that there's about 429 gigawatts of these plants across the globe, but it might be a surprise to you that China has the largest installed base of supercritical coal plants in the world. So yes, they're using coal, but everything that they're building is the latest most advanced technology for the use of coal. They lead this effort um, and their plans are to continue to push that envelope as we're doing in Tianjin with our green gen plant and with what they're doing in terms of their installed base. So I like to call this advancement of technology approach making black the new green, which is core to what we call the Peabody plan. 
When I was in Montreal for the World Energy Congress in late 2010, I introduced our plan which targets energy access for all by 2050. That's our prime objective. And I will tell you I'm still receiving letters from heads of state, ambassadors, and academics who agree coal is the solution to create energy access and build economies. The Peabody Plan calls for ensuring half of new generation globally comes from these advanced supercritical coal plants, that we commercialize carbon capture and find a way to utilize carbon or CO2, or as we're doing here at this university, find a way to feed it back into the electricity generation system to become more efficient. And by replacing older coal plants across the globe with supercritical technology, we'd create $4.3 trillion in increased economic activity and 21 million jobs during the construction phase alone based on the management information services work that was done out of Washington, D.C. But the avoided CO2 globally would be equivalent to pulling 100% of the automobiles off the streets of the United States forever. So when we want to try and make fundamental major changes to the second E, or environmental objectives, we have to look in the context of using best technology today, and then where do we advance technology to move forward in the future. If we were to operate and build all these plants, the long-term benefits are just huge. You know, the benefit of running a 1,000 gigawatt plant uh, is about $470 billion of increased economic output because you've got affordable, available, low-cost, reliable supplies of electricity that drives the underlying fabric of the economy. $170 billion of the personal income boost because of all of the jobs and related jobs. $90 billion in tax revenues for local entities. Uh, and, of course, about one and a half million jobs to run these plants on a, on a, on a, on a full-time basis. I will tell you, as a company, we continue to advance 21st entry, century energy solutions toward this ultimate goal and ultimate coal plant that would be virtually free of emissions. We're there now for criteria pollutants. The work that's being done and focused on right now is CO2. Just as China leads in the deployment of supercritical technology, it also leads the world in near-zero emissions technology. I referred earlier to our Green Gen plant. This is the Green Gen power plant and carbon research facility in Tianjin. Uh, and it's the, China's first coal gasification facility that will produce electricity, but also will ultimately capture all of its CO2 for enhanced oil recovery. Sounds like a simple solution, but they're the first ones to be doing it. Now, I've visited Green Gen many times because of our partnership there, and I can tell you that it's advancing very, very rapidly. Phase one's being commissioned right now. First unit's expected to be online the first quarter of 2012, the end of this quarter. But we need a global fleet of Green Gens as the world continues to increase its use of coal, which it will. So the power of the Peabody Plan to energize economies is perhaps nowhere more evident than South Africa which I think offers a compelling study. It's the largest economy on the continent. It gets 94% of its electricity from coal and uses 40 times more electricity than its sub-Saharan counterparts. Now, bringing the rest of Africa to parity with South Africa would require 4 billion tons of coal annually by 2050. But why is the plan so important? Well, in Ghana, 10% of the children die before they're five years old. In Rwanda, 52% of the children are stunted from malnutrition. And in Cameroon, life expectancy is only 50 years. Citizens deserve better than that. And it's available, affordable, reliable, accessible energy, particularly electricity, that's going to make the difference in their lives as it has in other developing parts of the world. So we've discussed the energy markets, the economic benefits of using coal, and the technology that leads to environmental solutions. Now let's turn to the vision and leadership that is needed to push our three goals to the finish line. Peabody is the world's largest private sector coal company based on tons sold in our industry-leading reserve base. Our global platform is unmatched. 
Now, earlier I said that sustainable leadership is the ability to look at where you need to be and then to know how to get there. Now, I think Peabody does offer a good example. A number of years ago, we recognized that to operate from a leadership position to serve high growth coal markets, we needed a broader global platform. And over a very short time, we transformed the company from what was a US-centric organization to a diversified global organization serving customers on six continents. And this year, we'll ship coal to more than two dozen nations representing more than half the world's population. Our transformation has included several acquisitions to build our Australian platform, the spin-off of our Appalachian assets, along with steady expansion in key US markets. We've expanded our global trading platform with offices in the United Kingdom, Beijing, Singapore, Essen, and New Delhi. We've opened business offices in Ulaanbaatar, Mongolia, and Jakarta, and Balikpapan, Indonesia. Much of this effort has been targeted toward what we call our, our Asian 100 vision, which is a target of achieving 100 million tons of volumes in Asia within a decade. Now, I think the wisdom of our decision and the strength of our platform are demonstrated by the strong financial growth trajectory that we've had. Revenues are up 80%, operating profits are up 170%, and EBITDA is up 120% during the time when most of this change was occurring. I would say all of this is highlighted by our performance in 2011, which represented the best safety, operating, and financial performance in our company's history. So you can see as Peabody's earnings have increased over time, the impact is accentuated by our international earnings contribution. Global activities accounted for about 1% of our earnings in 2003. Today they make up half of Peabody's EBITDA coming from a much larger base. Now these results follow a period period when Peabody was the only US-based coal company with a plan to transform its global platform. At that time, many questions were ahead of us, but we forged ahead anyhow. Business leadership is about identifying a company strategy and implementing it. It requires understanding economics and identifying the right markets, and in our case, the best markets for long-term growth. We had the energy strategy in place to make an entry into Asia and expanded our platform in Australia, the world's largest exporter, accounting for the most export growth in the future. All of this comes together under the banner of balancing our environmental, economic, and energy goals, meeting our 3E vision. We did exactly what we set out to do, and we're still progressing our plan. How you set out to achieve the right strategy is also as important as what you do and what you set out to do. Combination of where do you want to be and how do you want to get there. So let me talk about leadership. At Peabody, we define leadership using four key pillars. Inspiration, innovation, collaboration, and execution. In fact, 50% of our performance management goals and merit increases for senior executives are linked to leadership skills. My first job as an engineer out of college offered a good test of how to inspire a workforce. I was working at a Kennecott mine in southern Arizona and was, believe me, very green when I became a supervisor. There were a lot of employees with 20 or more years of experience working at the mine. So I'd go directly to those senior workers and say, this is what we've been asked to accomplish. What's the best way to do it? Which started a dialogue. They'd been doing it over a long period of time. They'd been doing it much longer than me. And they knew what worked, and they knew the pitfalls of what didn't work. Involving them in the process on the front end made them invested in the outcome, and it drove our success. Core to an inspired workforce is making sure everyone understands the goal, showing respect for the knowledge and input of others, using a best practice approach, and always giving credit where credit is due. Again, reflecting on my early career, in just a 10-year period at Kennecott, I had 18 different jobs. I got to wonder if I was going to be able to hold a job, but... 
it was a critical period in my development because it was all about stretching my ability to learn new and different things about the operating environment. Um, so you can see as an engineer out of school, I spent very little time in pure engineering and a lot of time using my engineering skills across a broader platform of job responsibilities. Sometimes I had to innovate just to learn the new role, just to learn what the role was. Um, I had to find resources so that I could learn the jobs and it often required a complete new skill set to understand the job that I was asked to do. But it's important to be open to change and to embrace new ways of thinking. At Peabody, we tackle projects with teams at every level, bringing in subject matter experts when they're needed and using a blend of resources to stretch our fullest potential. This leads me to collaboration, which is building strong teams. I'll finish with one last example back in my Kennecott days. There were a number of supervisors who never bothered to listen to their teams. They thought they knew it all, they'd received their degree, they'd been anointed, and they'd run the job their way. Well, I'm sure you can all guess what happened to those folks in a very short period of time. People were less than cooperative, and most of them didn't succeed. And they moved on. A good leader secures success by engaging the right people. A, st a strong team structure creates better ownership and accountability so that you can execute your goals. And then lastly, execution is putting all together, this all together to drive strong results. It's transforming a U.S.-centric company to one with a global platform serving six continents. At Peabody, we have a monthly operational meeting that we call, quote, driving results to review key performance indicators across the entire platform. But we don't do it in silos. We do it with a large group so that everybody understands the issues. Everybody may have a suggestion and is free to raise their hand whether it's trading equipment or looking at people resources or blending our coal products or meeting a customer need, we do it on a collaborative, innovative basis within the context of those meetings. So we use our leadership pillars to drive results. We also constantly benchmark and constantly raise the bar to achieve continuous improvement. Now leadership comes in many forms. And leadership demonstrated by engineering alumna Bob Malone and his wife Diane is shaping the future of many of University of Texas El Paso's best and brightest engineers for the 21st century. It really pulls together what I've been talking about in terms of leadership pillars and what we're trying to do as engineers in society. But thanks to their vision, the university is unique in offering a leadership engineering bachelor's program that will launch this fall. Um, Bob is president and CEO of First National Bank of Sonora, Texas. Last I checked, Bob didn't go to school to be an accountant or a banker or a financier. But leadership skills, management skills, is transferable. It doesn't know boundaries. Because it takes you into that level of vision and leadership and drive and being able to move people in a direction that cuts across all sectors of what an economy does. Of course, Bob was executive vice president of BPPLC and uh, former chairman uh, of British Petroleum America. Um, I guess I would just like to recognize Bob and Diane are here with us today and uh, probably not too late to give them one more round of applause for what they've done for the university. <laughs> I've covered a lot of ground today and I'd like to try and sum it up. For Peabody, creating a sustainable future starts with a social contract. Job one is to create the energy access and to alleviate energy poverty. Our path is the Peabody Plan, which offers principled energy solutions for a world that desperately needs more energy. And finally, leadership starts with each one of us. 
and it's essential to advance both the what, but as critical, the how of what we do towards achieving our ultimate goals. Peabody is energy. Energy is the essential building block for a healthy modern society. Our work is vital and it sets the course for a sustainable future. You've all been kind to have me here with you today. Um, I'll leave it there, but I'll be very happy to take any questions that you might have. Thank you very much.